growing. And number two, we'd like to improve the value of agriculture, although right now the value of agriculture is pretty good uh, as it sits. And number three, do uh, farming in a more sustainable fashion. Um, just an example, we say we ship a lot of corn and Iowa soybean, most of which is shipped outside of the state to places around the world, and say, let's say California. Uh, anybody from California here? Okay, I won't do my pick on California thing. There's too many here, so. Um, but we send uh, corn to the happy cows in California. We can take it. <laughs> well, there's a commercial that we see here all the time. It's the happy cows that live in California, and it's a commercial. And they're all in this green pasture. And somehow I doubt they're really free-range cows all the way, all the time out there. But uh, anyway, we ship a bunch of corn out there, and of course, cattle aren't 100% efficient processing the food they eat. So out comes the manure. Um, it'd probably be a lot more sustainable if you fed the cattle here, took that manure and the nutrients that goes with it back to the land. In other words, tie the nutrients to the land more locally. It makes a lot more sense uh, economically and especially sustainability-wise. And then instead of sip, shipping six pounds of corn, which it takes to grow a pound of beef, you could ship one pound of beef. And so I think for a lot of reasons we should take a look at if you grow things in one location and you feed them to animals, you should probably feed the animals there so you can complete that nutrient cycle because the manure doesn't come back from California. I'll guarantee you that part. So that's just kind of the, the theme we're trying to hit is that more sustainable thing. And we really don't think you can provide all the transportation fuels in the United States from biomass or plant materials. We think that might be a bad idea in the long run, especially because at some point in time we're probably going to need anything that can grow crops is probably going to have to be used for food at some point in time you know, just a gas or it's going to get fairly expensive. So we think we should concentrate on food first and, of course, in a sustainable fashion. Um, chemicals, which there's, the pounds of chemicals isn't that, huge, that, isn't that huge that we use. Um, organic chemicals and, and uh, inorganic chemicals. And then fuel additives. You know, you can put some things in from the farmland that might be additive. So that's, that's our general theme. Um, that's, the, that's the whole gist of this presentation. I'll skip some of the lead-in stuff here about our groups because we are energy efficiency and alternative fuels. There's a lot of good opportunity for uh, creating jobs in both of these areas. If you do energy efficiency and do it well, make all the homes in Iowa and all the buildings in Iowa energy efficient, that takes a lot of work, creates a lot of jobs, and has a lot of benefits associated with it that pay back. So these things all pay back. Again, in a local economy, doesn't matter where you are. Energy efficiency first, and, and you guys all get that because you can see what happened in this building here. You really did energy efficiency first and then put the alternative energy on it. So to me, it's a perfect example, kind of a living example of what we think uh, should happen. Um, one thing, I think we've got some problems out there. Whoops. One of them is I step on a cord. But uh, the world energy facts, if you go through them, to me it gets kind of scary. And, and, and you've got choices and consequences. And some things like two kinds of choices. Minor consequences. What I had for lunch today probably overall isn't going to make a huge difference in my life down the road. I had some great food over there at the, at the commons. Um, really where you eat, um, where you build your house. I mean, it, it, it's, it has some consequences, what vehicle you drive. But some of the uh, choices you make with drastic life-altering consequences. Your career choice. You know, if you pick the wrong career and you're at a dead-end job and you hate it for your whole life, that's just, <laughs> that's not the way to go on living. Um, marriage, you make the wrong choice there, and uh, I asked this at one conference, and about, they weren't supposed to raise their hand if they had an unhappy marriage, but a few did when I asked them. Ask <laughs> um, obviously their spouses were not there. And really, your, your choice to continue to depend on import petroleum, in the United States at least, is a dangerous choice. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of things going on with petroleum, and uh, I think we need to wake up to see what might happen. Um, just a whole bunch of little things here for the lead-in. Uh, this group, the International Energy Agency, has basically been saying for the 20 years prior to 2007, plenty of petroleum, don't worry about it. It's a group of countries from around the world that get together and say, here's, here's the story on energy. In 2007, for the first time, they came out with a little more pessimistic view, and they showed that picture along with this title. 2012, um, in five years from 2007. And that picture uh, of the oil rig on fire in a, in a stormy sea is kind of my idea of the U.S. energy independence on imported petroleum. Because when I was in college, 
uh, the first uh, OPEC oil embargo happened. And basically, uh, the members of OPEC um, said, we can shut down your economy any day we want, and they cut off petroleum imports. So if people were standing in line, if you could get gasoline, you were waiting in line. And the price went way up, and I thought, well, boy, that's a kind of a precarious position. If they just decide overnight to say, you're done, and, and, and we've done it to ourselves, because we consume 28 barrels of oil per person per year, the United States, 28 barrels. China consumes two to three barrels of oil per person per year. And last year, for the first time ever, one country bought more automobiles in the United States, and that, and that was China. Now their consumption is going to skyrocket. They've got jobs now, they've got money to spend, and they're going to buy automobiles. GM sold more cars in China last year than they did in the United States. That's good. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not a good situation. So that was just a drawing, though, an artist rendition. And I didn't have to wait long, and here's what happened. Fell into the ocean. Yeah. Probably the biggest uh, environmental disaster in the history of the world. Uh, the, the whole Gulf of Mexico, um, petroleum all over. BP did a great job. There's a reason they kept injecting that dispersant at the well, even though EPA told them, don't do that or we'll find you. It, it basically sinks the oil to the bottom, breaks it up a little bit, and it's, it, <laughs> the consequence of that will be around for years and years and years. I don't think you could have, with any other raw material, raw energy source, a disaster as big as that. I just can't imagine how you could have one that bad. And, and that can happen again uh, at any point in time. Is that a photo? That's a photograph, yep. Wow. Is that thing exploding or just sitting there? Blue? It blew, well, first it blew up and then it burned. And I don't know, I, I, if there was a story of a person that made it off that thing by diving off the edge of the platform oh. into the fire and water below. And his story uh, is amazing. As, as to what just happened on that thing, but that's no, that's a real picture of that oil rig on fire. Looks like one of those like um, you know science fiction spaceships. It that, does. They got blown up. It does. <laughs> you couldn't have a more scary special effect in a movie than no. that. I don't think. But to me anyway. So I didn't have to wait long, and so my the artwork I saw the first time turned into a real thing. Then there's these guys running around, and they only have to succeed once. You have to succeed 100 percent of the time to stop them from doing these things, from blowing up major oil production unit. And nobody's successful 100% of the time. At some point in time, if they want to do this, it's going to happen. You cannot, you cannot stop it. <coughs> now this one, don't read it, but it's an EI, IEA update, that International Energy Agency update. And I think if, you, if you're interested in this type of thing, if you take the time to read what he says here about what's going on and how we all kind of have our heads in the sand about the problems associated with petroleum, and, and the, the severe, dire consequences that happen when any one of these things happen, whether it be a natural disaster like hurricanes knocking out oil rigs and refineries, or whether it be terrorist intervention or a, a war in certain parts of the world would uh, cause a, a huge problem. Um, just one of dozens of things that could happen with imported petroleum. And this economy, if it seems like it's low now, because of our huge dependence on import petroleum, our disproportionate share, we consume 25% of the world's petroleum in the United States. This economy will tube when oil prices go high. It's proven itself time and time again. When you see oil prices go way high, our economy starts sliding down. And we haven't seen the worst of it. Many sources, same message, U.S. military says, by 2015, watch out. And they say major shortages by 2012. Well, I mean, you've got groups of countries from around the world. You've got the U.S. military uh, trying to be. Um, and here's one of the things that's going on. So you can argue about when did peak oil happen? Is it going to happen in 10 years? Did it happen five years ago? Uh, things like that. But for sure, the United States oil peaked in 1970s, in the early 1970s. There's no question about that. North Sea oil, without question, has peaked. Saudi Arabia won't release the, the data, so we really don't know where they are. But if they've peaked, <laughs> then, then you haven't got time really to switch over. Um, but just, just the, the increase in demand alone, even if we had pretty good supplies, is going to put huge pressure on it. And China ends U.S. reign as largest auto market. Just uh, fairly recent news. They had a seven-day or 14-day traffic jam over there, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Seven days. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Um, and then Shell Oil, the oil company, tells you. Here's the way we used to be. The blue line's the, the line we like, the line you guys like. It's, uh, it's the one with the peak. I mean, excuse me, the red line and the green line are the lines that we like. Um, you started off in 18, thank you. 
start off in, in 1800, using mainly um, biomass, wind, water, animals, things like that. Of course, I, I don't know why solar isn't in there, but it should be. And then the fossil fuel era started kicking in, and, and they show us, Shell Oil shows us in this plateau, where you're not finding huge amounts of new fossil fuels. Uh, and so you're kind of meeting supply and demand. You notice any little tweak, they have about 100 reasons why oil prices go up for you. And that's what happens in this plateau. Any change in supply drastically improve, uh, impacts price because there's no elasticity. You can't just pump more out of the ground. And they show us already past the peak of the fossil fuel era in 2004. That's Shell Oil, an oil company there. The trouble is when you get to this point right here, it, it's a bell curve. We ramped up production capacity very fast. We're going to fall very fast when it starts falling. And if your economy still depends on petroleum to a large degree at this point, you've got two choices. Your economy goes down and you're in a depression, not a recession. Or you go to war to get your share of petroleum. <laughs> Neither one of those is very attractive at all. Um, especially when we're quite a ways working. Crude oil reserves, OPEC, Countries in red have almost 70% uh, of it. If you can find the United States, then I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> Literally a two-bit player. Um, and just keep the relative amounts in mind. Um, oil, uh, about 8,000 quads of oil up there. A quad is a, a, a lot of energy. <laughs> Coal, way more energy out there identified as reserves in, around the world. And then natural gas not near as much as petroleum. You know, you hear some people say, well, let's go to natural gas. Well, I'll explain why that's probably not a good idea. But right there, there's a guy named T. Boone Pickens. Everybody heard of him? Mm -hmm. T. Boone has some advertisements on. Let's switch to wind energy and natural gas, right? Do you remember that? Um, he's an oil man. He made billions of dollars in the oil industry, or however much he made, a huge fortune. And he says, we've got huge problems with it. And you'll see more and more people from the oil industry saying, we've got problems coming with that. So. Uh, why we're not reacting like we should, I don't know. Natural gas reserves, I give this presentation to the groups from around the world, I think 70 different countries now, but uh, when the crew from Europe comes in after this happened, uh, Russia is the biggest holder of natural gas reserves in the world. And in the middle of winter, uh, they shut off the pipeline to, to Northern Europe over a price dispute over it. Now, there's Russia with natural gas. Can you find the United States again? Instead of two percent, maybe four percent. If we switch to natural gas, we'll quickly be in the same situation we are uh, with petroleum. Uh, it's a little cleaner, you know, uh, for the environment. Uh, but as far as the United States being able to be sustainable uh, or produce its own energy, not sustainable, but produce its own energy, that's not going to happen with natural gas either. And instead of just depending on OPEC as the big player, You've got OPEC plus Russia. Um, anybody from Russia? <laughs> I, won't, I won't say anything. <laughs> the people from Europe are a little afraid of them. Just put it that way. Uh, when, the, when the people come in and talk about that, they're a little wary of what might happen. Um, for coal, if we're going to go with fossil fuels, and I wish we could just go with wind, solar, and biomass today, uh, there are some cost issues with it. Um, and maybe a little bit of lifestyle change, although it's getting much better out there. But if you had to pick a fossil fuel, it's obvious which one you want. And you could not have an environmental disaster with coal as big as what's happened with the Gulf of Mexico with oil. Um, there's a plant in North Dakota where they've been making chemicals from coal for decades. And for the last 10 years, they've been putting the carbon dioxide underground through a 200 mile pipeline into Canada through a depleted oil field and pumping it through underground storage. There's a lot of people that think there's enough places with underground storage for carbon dioxide to get us through 50 to 100 years. And at that point in time, if we made an effort, we should be all renewable at that point in time anyway. I think you might need some non-renewable sources for a while here. Um, but if you don't, that's great. But if you do, not, not anything but import petroleum. That would be my sales pitch. Uh, enough biomass. If you took the whole corn crop, in the United States and converted 100% to energy, you would produce 10% of the energy we use in the United States. You just can't get there. And corn grows better than hybrid poplars in terms of tons per acre year after year. You can't hardly beat it. Sorghum does better. 
uh, some grasses. They, they say it can do better, but that's, you know, on a little test plot. It's tough to beat the grow, growing potential of corn for converting sunlight into uh, plant material in this neck of the world. What we did in our group, we get a chance to step back and say, well, what would the ideal alternative fuel look like? Well, if you could make it from any raw energy source, then you can't go wrong. Say your country picks nuclear, and this country picks hydro, and this country picks solar, and mixes. Of course, you're going to pick a mix of the thing. But no matter what raw energy source um, you have, if you can make that ideal liquid fuel, transportation fuel from it, that would be a great advantage, right? Uh, second thing we'd like to see, cost effectiveness. We don't just want the rich to be able to, to have the energy. We want to be able to have the everyday citizen to be able to, to afford uh, the energy they need. And in order to make that cost effectiveness, you have to have significant storage and delivery systems already in place. <coughs> Environmentally friendly, I mean, that's, that's a given. If you could use it in any type of engine, one fuel works in all types of engines, that would be a huge benefit for infrastructure and delivery, and therefore cost effectiveness. Uh, proven acceptable safety record, you don't want it to be any more dangerous than gasoline. And put your own country in there, produced in your country. If your country can produce its own energy, you can create a huge amount of jobs and, and, and really level things out in terms of uncertainties. As, as to what energy prices will be in the future. So. You're talking mainly transportation fuel, right? Transportation fuel in this case, yep. Exactly, yep. Well, it turns out, you know, hydrogen would be a great fuel, but you can't afford it. <laughs> you can't afford it. And so what we said, well, we like hydrogen, but since we can't afford it, let's look at something else. And it turns out anhydrous ammonia. Anybody have a farm background here? Anybody use anhydrous ammonia for fertilizer? <coughs> Anybody ever have an accident with it? <laughs> what happened? I got a big whiff of it. And you made a run for it? or? Oh, I just plain old messed me up. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> you, you recovered though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Mostly. Then my dad had some spill on him and he's got like scars on his leg. Yeah, yeah, you get, there, it's, and that's uh, one of the key issues that you have to address thoroughly because, you know, I've been in Iowa all my life. My friends have been playing with all kinds of things uh, during the time we're growing up, including gasoline and diesel fuel and around anhydrous ammonia. And none of my friends had any ammonia problems with it. You can't have them. But uh, three or four of them had some gasoline problems where about half the skin got burned off them at one time or another. Um, so it's a, it's a, what we had to do is really determine what is the real safety in this in terms of objective numbers. But anyway, the thing about ammonia, it's just an excellent way to carry hydrogen. It's the cheapest, lowest cost, most prevalent way of carrying hydrogen there is in the world. And of course, you're saying it's for nitrogen, for fertilizer. So the fertilizer industry, no, it's the way to carry nitrogen around the world. Um, we're saying it's the best way to carry hydrogen as well. So it carries those two things, probably two of the most important things you can have on this earth. They say anhydrous ammonia is one of the two most important inventions in the history of the world. Vaccines being the first most important one, antibiotics, vaccine. And then anhydrous ammonia, you, would, you could not eat the way you do around the world if you didn't have anhydrous ammonia. Now maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but it's uh, obviously a very good, and you can make ammonia taking nitrogen from the air. 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen right now. Um, and hydrogen from any source, and hydrogen is the most prevalent element in the universe. So you got two pretty universal things going for you there, uh, at least on this, this world, this planet. And you can make it from all fossil fuel, all renewable, all nuke sources. You, you can't pick a primary energy source you can't make ammonia from. You, you know, uh, yeah. Natural gas is CH4. So yeah. It's, very, it's just that like a, one thing with some hydrogen is connected to it. Yeah. In some ways, it's similar to natural gas in that way, right? There are some similarities. It, it handles more similar to propane, though. Ammonia is very similar to propane. It's, it almost liquefies at the same pressure, actually a little milder conditions, but yeah. There's some definitely uh, some similarities there. Ammonia is generally cost competitive with gasoline today. Over the last two decades, it's been cost competitive, so you're not going to break your budget if we go to this. We just, you heard of chicken or uh, pork called the other white meat. We call anhydrous ammonia the other hydrogen. And then there's, some, <laughs> there's more similarities between uh, ammonia and hydrogen there's between pork and chicken, I guarantee you that. <laughs> ammonia is in the top three chemicals delivered worldwide already. It is all around you. In the city limits of Tampa Bay, there's huge 20,000 to 30,000 ton storage tanks right in the city limits of Tampa Bay. New Orleans, Portland, Oregon, all around Iowa. Anybody seen these big tanks? They're great big white tanks that may be 40 foot tall and you know, 
You mean like the big round ones? Yeah, they're absolutely they're huge. Sphere? They're usually not a sphere. They're oh. usually a cylinder. Um, but um, yeah. uh, so. so I don't know if there's any big ones around no, here. There's a lot. I mean, at the farm, uh, at the uh, farm supply place, there's tons of small tanks. Right. Yeah. Those little nurse tanks that ever feel they're about either 500 or 1,000 gallon tanks usually, and they're again they're all over. They're around you all the time. You cannot get away from Anaheim ammonia in this state. You can't get very far from it. I drive past an ammonia storage facility right in the middle of the town I live in on the way to work every day. If I take that particular route. Ammonia is very environmentally friendly when used as a transportation fuel. You only produce two things, uh, nitrogen, N2, and H2O. You do produce some NOx, nitrous oxides, but the way we eliminate NOx in, 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 in tailpipes and, and from diesel engines and from coal plants is we inject a little ammonia over a catalyst to react with the NOx and it forms N2 and H2O. So your fuel also is your environmental abatement product. You come out cleaner than hydrogen. If you just had a hydrogen engine, you, you produce some NOx, and you'd have to add some ammonia in the tailpipe to get rid of the NOx. Okay, so it's cleaner than hydrogen. That's hard to believe, but true. Uh, ammonia is successfully demonstrated in spark ignition engines, compression ignition engines, or diesel engines, and fuel cells. So it can work in any prime mover or gas turbine. Uh, we cooked some hot dogs and marshmallows over an ammonia flame in, inside the building uh, last month, and I could not smell any residual ammonia. You're, you can smell ammonia way, way, way before it, it can get to levels that harm you. So it's, it's an automatic detect. In ammonia production plants, they work with both high-pressure hydrogen and ammonia. They're more afraid of the hydrogen because you can't smell hydrogen leach. You can't even see it. It self-ignites coming out of the pipe and you don't see the flame. So your hard hat melts out before you really know exactly what's coming out of hydrogen. <laughs> if you're lucky or if it explodes, then you're really in trouble. You cannot, it's, you could probably make ammonia vapors explode, but you'd have to be, you know, trying. You'd have to have a huge electric spark in just the right oxygen and ammonia mixtures. We can't get it to do it in the engine. We have to do some tricks to, to make it happen. Yes, sir? Can you please tell me what an SI engine and a CI engine is? Yeah, spark ignition would be like a gasoline engine, uh, be spark plug ignited. Compression ignition would be like a diesel engine, uh, so you ignite it with compression. And uh, a company out of Kansas City is going to bring up a demonstration to our facility, they said, within the next few months to show a PEM fuel cell run on ammonia. And people have said that can't be done because small levels of ammonia will poison PEM fuel cells, the kind they want to use for on. We've got direct ammonia fuel cells that'll be cheaper anyway, and you can run ammonia directly and then of course you'll poison those. So. Uh, some more ammonia basics, but there's that coal plant in, in Beulah, North Dakota where they've been putting the carbon dioxide underground. There's several commercial locations where they're making money putting carbon dioxide underground because they get more oil out of the ground at this point in time. So the technology is there. The governor of Montana says there's enough places identified to store carbon dioxide underground there from, say, coal uh, to cover the United States for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and he's, a, he's a, actually a real environmentalist, but he's the governor of a state that has a lot of coal, so he's got, <laughs> he's got to walk the line. But the point is, coal can be much cleaner than petroleum. You cannot take carbon dioxide out of the tailpipe with any known commercially available technology and put it underground. Yes, Does sir. that factor in the mining process as well? Uh, you mean from the environmental standpoint? Or just, I mean, social, environmental, social. Oh, well, I mean, we don't put numbers on it. Um, I mean, I mean, oh, emissions from. Petroleum is obvious because yeah. you, got, you got more instability. Widespread, but then coal, I guess, it's just a little less out there. That you, I mean, the whole kind of sawing off the top of the mountain, sort of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, I wish we could do all renewables, but you know, to me, it's the lesser of evils. I, I think, I don't think if you spent about the biggest coal spill you could have would be a unit coal train, 100 cars sure. tipped off near a river, and that I don't think that would match what happened in the Gulf of Mexico with oil on the on the on the production transportation side, on the production trans and then on the emission side. I, there's no question. With commercially available technology, coal can be cleaner than petroleum. Yeah. So, yes, sir. Um, the sludge ponds from coal mining out there leaking is that? That's a bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, that, it, I'm not uh, saying you're not right about the one or the other. Yeah. You have to get there, and it really takes the conduit. Yeah. I wish I had some numbers on that because the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico probably is going to take care of about thousand sludge ponds 
uh, spelling in the wrong location. I mean, you got to, they have to be more careful about where they locate these things. Um, the coal coming out of uh, Pennsylvania stuff is a high risk proposition. I don't think that's maybe the best place in the world to be doing that. But I mean, I'm not trying to sell coal. I'm just trying to bash petroleum. So <laughs> that's kind of, I've got a one track mind. <laughs> Anything's better than petroleum. <laughs> as bad as coal is, it's better than petroleum. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any, any, anything is better than petroleum, I think. Uh, from a variety of standpoints. That's just some costs of how anhydrous ammonia could compare as a fuel. What are your asterisks for on that? Uh, kind of the source. From that source. Can't mark it reported. But generally, it makes sense that ammonia is going to track about the same cost of gasoline. The cost per million BTU or per unit energy for natural gas and coal is way lower than gasoline historically. They all track together. Since you make ammonia primarily from either coal or natural gas, and since they're way lower cost in throwing that processing cost, maintains about the same. So the cost float with the relative cost of coal, natural gas, and petroleum. Yes, sir? We've got like ethanol written twice and gasoline written three different. times. Yeah, I put different units on there. Gasoline at two bucks a gallon. These prices change on me so quickly over the years that I just start putting ranges on it. Uh, gasoline at two fifty a gallon. Now I'm low. <laughs> ethanol is that. That's about a high. Yeah, it's a, it's a high range for ethanol. It's approaching there. Ethanol at one point was down here. Um, so just to kind of give a range of costs I've seen over the last decade um, of different costs in there. So this future could look like this. Uh, wind and biomass, solar and biomass, clean coal or nukes, um, producing nitrogen, hydrogen, ammonia, storage and delivery for fertilizer, transportation, and stationary power. Uh, it would be a really nice clean world when we get to that, especially when we get to these. And we're going to have a 1.5 megawatt wind to ammonia project start up this spring up in Morris, Minnesota. Um, there's a company called Syngest that wants to make corn cobs into ammonia here in, in the United States. You know, it's tricky to make ethanol from cellulose. There's billions of, hundreds of millions of dollars spent trying to find good ways to turn cellulose into ethanol. It's really easy to turn cellulose into anhydrous ammonia. So if you want your transportation fuel made from cellulose instead of corn, have at it. The technology's there, you just have to have the cost figure right. And you have to make the choice to move to ammonia. It's a pretty small, the ammonia army is a pretty small group now. You can probably, in this room, take care of it. Ammonia, in order to deliver liquid energy cost effectively, you have to pipeline it. There's a problem with pipelining ethanol, believe it or not. I won't go into that. But uh, ammonia has been pipelined in the United States for decades, starting with the, with the ports. And they deliver it from ships, ocean going vessels. Um, put in a pipeline, stands up through Minnesota, back into Ohio, and back down into Texas. So. It's a proven performer on pipelines. If you got real aggressive and you say made natural gas into ammonia, you can, if you crack 20% of the ammonia back into hydrogen and the rest is uncracked, it burns just like natural gas. So you could put it in your gas furnace, you could put it in your gas range. Uh, you can also make it run like propane, and it's just kind of a uh, computer controlled process, but it's very easy to crack that hydrogen and ammonia apart. Very low bond energy strength there. Um, but you could take natural gas produced down here, turn it directly into ammonia, put it directly in the pipelines, uh, change the compressors to pumps, deliver one and a half times more energy through that same pipeline that natural gas is delivering in now if you deliver it by ammonia. And you've got 2.8 million miles of pipeline. So this, there's, there's no big te technological barriers. It's all pretty much political. Take, take your choice if you want to do it or not. Here's the ways ammonia is stored and transported. That's the type of tank I was talking about there. There's another couple of them. Transoceanic vessels. Um, and ammonia just performs really well. And, and we're going to create so many jobs if we make our own energy in the United States. you got national security things that will really help out. Uh, create a huge amount of jobs and, and make the environment as clean as you want to be. Put your regulations here. You can't regulate other countries though. So back to Beacon. That was the, yeah. While you're on the ammonia thing, but you know, say you know, we have times like probably today where our batteries are full and our solar panels are just sitting there loafing. Would it be difficult for us to take that surplus solar energy and make ammonia with it that we could then, you know, do something with later? It would not be difficult. There's a company in Europe, and they gave a presentation at our last conference in Romulus, Michigan. We went, went near Detroit with this conference this year to see what would happen. And they didn't blow us up or anything, so they probably <laughs> didn't hear about us. But anyway, uh, 
he's working on smaller and smaller scale ammonia production units, and he says his goal is basically making a coffee thin water you can put it in your residential house, make it from electricity you generate what, there. What's the what do you do? What do you what's the process of electricity to ammonia? Process you can do it two ways. You can use an electrolyzer and crack it into hydrogen. Crack the water into water into hydrogen and yeah. oxygen, so you get hydrogen. Yeah. And then you'd have to get ammonia from the or nitrogen I, from the air. I did earlier, yes. And there's Can a couple different ways of doing that, either with membranes or with uh, low temperature mm -hmm. separation, turn them into liquid right. and separate. One would be a good. So then it would be much easier then to store the ammonia than with the hydrogen. Oh, Which much cheaper. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the example I give. So you, it's basically electrolysis. Then, yeah. Then turn it into ammonia so you can store it. Well, there's some companies going and doing it in one step. Okay. You don't have to have the ammonia synthesis. You just bring okay. in air. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and, and water. Okay, thank you very and much. And they have a unit that will combine those in one step. So, are there any biological processes that uh, that take sunlight to produce to produce uh, ammonia? There are. I mean, plants fix nitrogen from the air all the time. We're working on that too to see if we can get as good as the mother nature is, and we can't even come close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're looking at that route to see if we can do it the way nature does it. We can't right now, but we're giving it a try to see how that works. That would really be nice if we get there. I think I read something on the internet about a large offshore wind power ammonia station. Yeah, yeah, the Ocean Energy Institute wants to do that in a big way. There's a guy named Matt Simmons, and he's another one of those guys that made million, hundreds of millions in the oil industry as an investor, funded huge oil investments, and he said, he looked at the numbers, so we have problems. And so he switched over to ammonia, and, and his comment was, uh, it's the only practical way to get off import petroleum. And, he, but he, and then he passed away in a hot tub three months oh. ago, so bad news for us and, and him, <laughs> obviously. What the well, if you're a cynic, you say it's because it's practical and, and you could have a solution near term and people don't want a solution near term, but there's a safety issue. You, you, ammonia is a dangerous chemical. Um, even though it's in your body right now, it's in every one of your bodies, it's a naturally occurring thing, it's not a carcinogen, it's not a greenhouse gas. In, in concentrated quantities, it's bad for you. you know, but if you're under 10 foot of water, that's not good for you either. Um, but it, it, ammonia is dangerous. It's a strong base. It's a strong base, like a strong acid, it'll burn, uh, basic burns. And that's why we, we funded a study, because my experience was, well, I'd rather uh, you know, deal with ammonia than gasoline if the terror is coming after me. I can escape ammonia, it's lighter than air, it gets away from you pretty quick um, once it evaporates. So it's, it's the, the real reason is probably that people will try to lean on would be safety. But we've spent a lot of money on a report to see the numbers on that and I'll tell you about that. I'll just tell you about that. A, a company that does comparative risk assessment analysis for the petroleum and uh, fertilizer industry, I called them up and said, since you work in both areas, could you compare gasoline, propane, and, and uh, ammonia with your studies? And their studies are evidence in court of law, whether you were negligent or not, and chemical spills, and you know, whether you did things right, or with an acceptable risk. And it turned out it's significantly safer than propane when used as transportation fuel, and about the same as gasoline. You're a little safer close in to an accident and a little more dangerous farther away, because if gasoline doesn't blow you up, you know, and you're a block away, it's probably not going to get you. Where ammonia can drift before it rises up, and so it can cause you some problems. But uh, I will tell you, when we started this in 2004, there wasn't anybody on board. We had 23 people at the first conference. In the last three years, uh, Toyota um, has come, the, the second guy in command of Toyota has come over with five different companies um, last year from Japan. Um, Honda's joined in on the effort. Uh, Hitachi wants to convert an ocean going vessel to it, and they've got a test lab. Southwest Research Institute, which tests all engines for fuels and certifies them, they're going through a process where they're certifying engines on ammonia now. So you don't hear about it now. Uh, our biggest problem is DOE won't recognize it right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, number one, we have zero money and we don't have any political clout. So uh, if that could happen, uh, Toyota said they could announce some exciting things. They published a patent that shows how you use ammonia in, in, in engines and fuel cells. So, uh, yeah. Could you retrofit like a stand like I don't know, a Toyota Camry that's running on the road now? Yep. Yeah, you could. There's a company called ICOM that's the biggest producer of retrofit kits for propane and natural gas in the world. They're based in Italy and then they have a branch here in the United States. They said, I asked them when can I buy the ammonia kit, and they said March, but I've been disappointed before when I asked them about deadlines on different companies. It always takes a little longer to bring it to market, and they say, but they told me this March that I could buy an ammonia conversion kit. It's going to be similar to a propane conversion, 
you ever converted like a bus to propane? Uh, I don't know what the, what the exchange is, like are you losing horsepower or torque, or is it fairly even? We, uh, we uh, on Iowa State's campus, we ran a John Deere diesel engine, and the modification we made, now this is not automatic controls, this is us all the valves and stuff, so it's not ready for uh, commercial use. We drilled a hole after the turbocharger on the air side, and we ran the ammonia gas uh, into that with the combustion air, and we got down to at 90% ammonia on an energy basis and 10% um, diesel fuel, biodiesel <coughs> fuel. We ran 110% of rated load on that engine. So you don't have to lose power, and you don't have to produce a lot of NOx, even though there's a lot of nitrogen. And those are the two surprises that we had when we started. Yeah. So it could even be a, a multi fuel engine. You could either run it 100% on biodiesel if you wanted to, or like 90% ammonia and 10% biodiesel. Um, I think so. We haven't proven that yet. I think so. Though. It's easier in a spark ignition engine. Diesel has a way high octane rating. You cannot get it to pre-ignite or ignite at the wrong time. In fact, that's <laughs> it's a difficulty. We have to split some of it in hydrogen to get it to ignite right. That's not much of a trick. You just run it through a hot tube on the catalyst and it splits part of it. So now you've got a hydrogen ammonia mix and then it burns just like natural gas and then it works great. But in a compression ignition engine, you have to have the compression ratio so high, which is great for efficiency. The higher the efficiency, the, the, the higher the compression ratio, the higher the efficiency in an engine. You can run ammonia engines as high as you can mechanically make that compression ratio. So you can run the, the highest efficiency engine in the world would run on ammonia uh, because of high compression. But you still can't compression ignite it without some additive. So you're going to have to put something in like a, uh, in a biodiesel or, or diesel fuel. Uh, so the flex fuel, I mean, again, with our research budget, this stuff's not going to happen very fast so unless the big companies really bring out their stuff. But we've shown you can run it in those ranges. We have no automation you know, on it. So kind of getting back to Beacon of I, I'm going to run out of time, but I can tell. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> this is the facility I work at, and it's where we try to turn plant materials into chemicals, mainly chemicals, and fuel additives and uh, with the goal of improving rural economic development, recycling and processing locally so you're taking the nutrients back when we're done to the soil that it came from so you don't have to worry about how to redistribute. Although you can. Let's say you have one part of your farm that's real 